I was born in 1932 at a little town in North Carolina called Pine Tops. My father was a sharecropper. My mother was a seamstress. Back then, they didn't make quilts for beauty. They made quilts to keep you warm at night because it was no heat in the house. So we would have maybe two or three quilts on each bed in order to keep warm. My father would take cotton that we raised on the farm. Before they put it in bales, he would always take some out for my mother to use in her quilts. She was a seamstress and sold for everybody, so she always had scraps. But a lot of the people made quilts out of old clothes or feed bags, anything that they could put together to keep warm. Sharecropping quilting is this practical knowledge and application of sewing mixed with this joy for life. The cultural significance of documenting sharecropping quilting is because it finally gives a name to a form of quilt making in the African American community. Before this time, there was no name for this art form. They just say African American quilting. I used to watch my mother sew. She would sew for the neighborhood, and they would bring her a picture or something and make whatever they wanted. To me, it just came natural. No one never taught me. I never went to school for designs and all that. I first started out making my own patterns because most of the quotes was about my childhood. No better way to express your memories that you can put all this stuff in maybe 22 inches. Before I got into quilting, I was making clothing. And I would make clothes for myself and people would see them, ask me, did you make that? I said, yes. Would you make one for me? So I started sewing for the neighborhood. I made everything but shoes. I never made any shoes. I joined the African American Quilters of Baltimore. And one of the things I noticed was that um, many of the women were in their 80s and 90s, and they had never been documented. And I was just very interested in their stories and I wanted to know more about them. They couldn't quite articulate um, their experience with language, but they could definitely articulate their experience with fabric. It's a feeling that's hard to explain and a feeling that you would never know unless you do a quilt. <laughs> I have one of my mother's quilts, and at first I kept it on my bed, but it started fraying around the edges. So I made another quilt exactly like the one my mother made, and that's on my bed every night. When I go to sleep at night, and I wrapped the quilt around me. I felt like I was getting a hug from her. I am so interested in lived experiences of these sharecroppers. These quilts tell a story and a journey from that time to now. You know, they came up before civil rights. So this freedom that they have to express themselves with this textile, it's not just artistically significant, it has a profound cultural significance that we may not even know until years later. And if she's one of the last ones that we can talk to, imagine if we missed this story. You can do anything that you wanna do, anything you have in your mind that you wanna do, and you can draw it you can put it in a quilt because all you have to do is cut it out and add seam allowance and put it back together. You could put pants on ants. You could put dresses on fish. Anything that you could imagine, you could do it with a quilt. So I think it's important to not let that die, to keep it going. My way of preserving it and passing it along 
will not just be making quilts, but making books. I use quilt making principles and practices to make the pages. My introduction to the African-American quilters was as someone already working with textiles at the Smithsonian and with scholars. But with Catherine and sharecropping quilting, I didn't have to go to any library. Catherine Wooten is the library. I'm at the end of what I had done, and I want to leave behind something that I have done while I'm passing through. It means everything to me to have a chance to share what I've done in my life with someone else.